Good morning and welcome to the second meeting of the Education, Children and Young People's Committee in 2021. I'd like to open the meeting by welcoming our newest member, Willie Rennie, MSP, who joins us this morning for the first time. Willie will be replacing his colleague Beatrice Wishart, MSP, on the committee. So a very warm welcome again, uh, Willie. Before I invite Willie to declare any relevant interests, I would like to thank Beatrice for her work on both this committee and the Education and Skills Committee in the last parliamentary session. And while we're sorry to lose her, we're also very pleased to have Willie joining us. So can I take this opportunity to ask Willie Rennie if he has any relevant interests he wishes to declare? Willie. Uh, thank you, convener, uh, and thank you also for the, the warm welcome. Um, I have no interest to declare. Thank you. A bit of a dodgy connection, but we heard you say that you have no interest to declare, so thank you for that. So moving on to the second item on our agenda today, can I ask whether members are content to take agenda items seven and eight in private? Are we all agreed? Thank you. Nodding heads. And the third item on the agenda is to hear evidence from the Minister for Children and Young People and her officials on the provision of early learning and childcare, specified Children Scotland Amendment No. 2, Order 2021 Draft. And I would like to welcome the Minister to the committee this morning. The Minister is accompanied by Joanne McKenzie, Team Leader Targeted Children and Family Wellbeing, Scottish Government, and Claire Cullen, who is a lawyer. Scottish Education Branch, Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Good morning to you all and welcome to our committee. Ms Hockey, can I invite you to speak to the draft instrument? Thank you very much, Convener, and this is my first opportunity to speak at the Education Committee. Can I welcome you and Ms Stewart to your roles and uh, also the new committee members? This amending order will increase the income thresholds for families with a two-year-old who is eligible for funded early learning and childcare ELC uh, because they get a joint working tax credit and child tax credit or a universal credit award. Without this amendment, the relevant order currently specifies that a two-year-old is eligible for funded ELC if their parent is in receipt of child tax credit and working tax credits with an annual income that does not exceed £7,320, or the parent is in receipt of universal credit with a monthly income that does not exceed £610 per month. This amending order will increase the income threshold to £7,500 per year for households in receipt of both child tax credit and working tax credits. Universal credit income threshold will increase to £625 per month. We are making this change to reflect changes at a UK level. The UK Government has increased the national living wage from £8.72 to £8.91 per hour and has reduced the age at which a person receives it from 25 years of age to 23 and over. These changes mean that it is no longer possible for a parent of a two-year-old aged 23 or over uh, to meet the criteria for those on combined working tax credit and child's tax credit or on universal credit. The purpose of this order is to protect eligibility for two-year-olds, who we would expect to be eligible for funded ELC as a result of their parents or carers being in receipt of those affected qualifying benefits. If we choose not to make any changes to the income thresholds, we estimate that around 1,000 eligible two-year-olds would no longer be eligible, despite there being no significant difference in the household circumstances of these families. However, it is important to be clear that no two-year-old who is currently receiving funded ELC will be affected by these changes. Once a child has met the eligibility criteria, they remain eligible despite any subsequent changes in circumstances. For any child who became eligible after the change to the National Living Wage in April 2021 and have applied for a place to start in August, which is the next start date for children with a birthday between the 1st of March and the 31st of August, we wrote to all local authorities in June to request that they use their discretionary powers to allow for the increase in the National Living Wage. 
As the purpose of the amendment is to maintain eligibility, we do not anticipate a significant increase in the number of two-year-olds who become newly eligible for the provision. We do not expect a significant impact on local authorities' ability to fund this provision within the current financial settlement, and as such, there is no evidence that additional funding is required to support implementation of the amendment. The impact on uptake will, however, be closely monitored by both Scottish Government and COSLA through the appropriate mechanism, which is the ELC Finance Working Group. And appropriate arrangements will be made if uptake is significantly above the expected level and local authority costs increase as a result. We will monitor future increases in the national living wage, and we expect that it will be necessary to uprate thresholds annually in order to keep pace with the standard of living. We have agreed with COSLA that this current amendment and future amendments are necessary to maintain a similar profile of eligible children. I am happy to respond to any specific questions that the committee may have, convener. Thank you, Minister. Um, I am going to call uh, Willie Rennie. Willie wanted to ask a question, make a comment. Willie. Yeah, thanks, convener, and, and thanks, Minister, for explaining all that. I have got no problem. In fact, I support the, the proposed changes, but the Minister will know that the, the uptake for the provision of two-year-olds is particularly low across the country, with only around about a third of those eligible are accessing the service. So can the Minister maybe just take the opportunity to tell us what efforts have been made to increase that uptake? There is little point in changing the criteria unless we can actually deal with a bigger problem, which is the general low uptake. Minister. It, thank you, Convener. Thank you, Mr. Rennie, for your question. I think that that is a really important one, and one that we are very aware of. We are working um, across Scotland to ensure that all families know the benefits of the offer and are able to access it. We are, uh, uh, that work includes working with the UK government to address data sharing issues, uh, so that councils in Scotland can target information at eligible families. We're working across agencies to improve access of information to families to uh, help them make informed decisions about ELC provision. And we're also working with councils and Who Cares Scotland to make the most of the extension to funded ELC to two year olds with a care experienced parent. We're also exploring uh, further ways of uh, engaging with uh, those professionals who uh, work closely with these families, for example, fam family nurse practitioners, health visitors, social care workers, to ensure that they inform families of their eligibility and encourage them where appropriate and where those families wish to, to uptake their offer of ELC. And can I just ask about the, the data sharing, uh, Minister? I mean, you mentioned the, the issue of data sharing with the UK government. How is that going? Are there any issues uh, that we should be made aware of? Uh, because obviously that, that could be a direct impediment to the nature of the delivery of this, this benefit. Uh, yes, of, co of course, and we've been working very closely with the UK government in terms of data sharing, so that uh, local authorities can access the data to uh, target some of those families for information about that. I'm happy to pass over to uh, Joanna, who's on the call, who will be able to update you uh, more fully in terms of the work that's been done. If that would be uh, if, if that would be all right with you, convener. I think it's a critical issue. So yes, a, a mm -hmm. short. Uh, yep. Response would be good. Yes, Joanna. Hi. Yeah. There's been um, ongoing work. I think the, the previous committee were aware that we were working with the UK government on this and had been hoping to bring some regu um, regulations, um, draft regulations, which are UK ones, um, to the attention of the committee last year. That work um, has been impacted um, by the pandemic and other other issues. But we are currently working with them on the draft consultation document, and we expect that to be out in the next in the next uh, few weeks. So that's the draft regulations that will allow the legal gateway, that will allow um, local authorities to receive information from DWP and HMRC on um, the specific families in their area um, that meet the eligibility criteria. There's also work ongoing at the same time um, for um, for the mechanism. How we'll do that? So there's two parts of it: the legal gateway and then the mechanism, and that works ongoing as well. So they should happen at the same time. So we're hoping for that at some point next year. Thank you. Well, we'll look forward to hearing updates on that because that's a critical part of this process. And Minister, one last question from me: um, 
Is there a reason why this has to be reviewed annually? Why, why isn't this just an automatic thing that happens when the national living wage goes up, that, 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 these, that there are automatic changes? Is there a reason for that? Help me understand that. Yeah, and, and this is a question, Mr. Kerr, that I asked myself. Why, why is this something that we have? And, 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 and I think the, the, uh, the, the sort of simplest answer is that we don't know what the increases to the national living wage will be year on year. Um, and to ensure that we maintain the eligibility for the families who are uh, currently eligible for, uh, for this ELC offer, um, that's why we're doing this on a yearly basis. Okay, so that it can't happen automatically, whatever the rate increase is. Uh, two colleagues wanting to come in. I'm going to bring back in Willie Rennie and then Oliver Mundell. The, the earlier answer was was very helpful, Minister. But um, is part of the problem not the structure of the provision of the service? You'll find that the the centres for Parat, um, and sometimes not in every single community, so people have to travel quite some distance in order to access the local nursery or early learning facility. Um, and when you're on low incomes, that might be particularly challenging. Um, has there been any discussions with, with COSLA and with councils about making sure there are a greater number of centres so that you can access a centre more local to you? Um, Convener, I missed part of, part of the, the start of that question, so I hope I'm able to answer Mr. Rennie fully. And if not, if I haven't answered his question, I'm more than happy to uh, to write to the committee with an update on the work that we that we are doing with COSLA. Is, is Mr. Rennie we aware there's been a huge expansion of the ELC estate um, right across the country, and in, in all, just about all local authorities, there's been additional building work done. Recently, we were keen to encourage and um, promote the ELC offer to eligible two-year-olds, and we'll continue to do that through all avenues that we can. We remain very, uh, we work very closely with COSLA uh, on this and other issues relating to ELC. But if I've not answered his question fully, there, I'm more than happy to, to come back to the committee. Thank you, Minister. Um, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Convener. I hadn't intended to, to ask a question, but obviously, just hearing the comments around data sharing, I'm, I'm kind of confused because I know those have been kicking about for a while, and I understand the issues with them. But even even those uh, issues put to one side, the number of two-year-olds registering uh, has fallen uh, since uh, since since this program was introduced. So there are actually less two-year-olds uh, benefiting now than there were when it started. Um, and I just wondered if the minister. I had an explanation for that, um, and also, um, is it correct? Because um, I hear it from from local uh, ELC providers that that they're actively discouraged uh, from going out to engage directly with families; that they have to wait uh, for the local authority and others to identify them. They can't go out into their own communities and publicise this. Is that is that correct? Um, on, on Mr. Mundell's uh, second point, that's not, certainly not something that, that I recognise. Local authorities and, and Scottish government have worked very closely on this, and we are certainly keen that, that any child who, whose, whose carers or parents are keen to take up this offer are, are aware of it, and I think that's, that's really important, and that they're able to make an informed choice about whether or not they access that ELC offer. Obviously, that's not going to be um, you know, suitable or, or wanted by every family, but we need to ensure that people are aware of that, and we'll continue to work hard to do that. And if Mr. Mundell has specific uh, concerns in specific areas, I would be very keen for him to write to me so that we can look to try and address that with with their COSLA and local authority colleagues. Um, we we are keen to ensure that any child who is uh, eligible that for this. A ELC offer is able to take that up if appropriate, and we'll continue to work hard to promote that through, as I, as I said in my previous answer, I think to Mr. Rennie, um, through all channels and all avenues that we can do. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to colleagues who have contributed thus far. Um, I think if there's anyone else who wishes to say anything, this is the moment to say so. If not, I will proceed. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister and her officials for their evidence this morning. So now let's move straight on to our next agenda item. Um, our fourth item on the agenda is to invite the Minister to move motion S6M00700 that the Education, Children 
and Young People Committee recommends that the provision of early learning and child care specified children Scotland Amendment number no. two order twenty twenty one draft be approved. I would like to invite the Minister to speak to and move the motion. Formally moved, convener. Do members have any comments? Would the minister like to wind up? Uh, I don't think, convener, I have anything further to add to this, um, other than to thank the committee for their questions this morning. Thank you. The question is that motion S6M00700 in the name of Claire Hawkey be approved. Are we all agreed? Looks as if we are all agreed. Uh, I would now like to announce a two-minute suspension to allow the Minister and her officials, whom we thank again, to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Our fifth agenda item today is to consider another piece of subordinate legislation, the Registration of Independent Schools Scotland Amendment Regulations 2021. This instrument is being considered under the negative procedure. Do members have any comments on the instrument? from colleagues. So, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? Are we agreed? We are agreed, I think. Moving then on to thank you. Moving on to our next agenda item this morning, the committee will take evidence from the OECD in relation to their recent reports on Scottish education. And I am delighted to welcome to the committee Dr. Beatrice Pawn, Senior Analyst, Education Policy, and Roman Vienne, Policy Analyst from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. So we are 
hoping to take about an hour and a half of your time, uh, Dr. Pollan. And I'm just trying to see if I can see, but yes, I look across my screen to make sure I can see uh, Roman uh, Vianney. You're both very welcome. Now, I'll start the questioning and then I'll bring in my colleagues as we go. And these questions are directed to both or either of you from me. Um, what I'd like to know is how the, the pandemic restricted your ability to do this report especially when it came to evidence gathering. What would you have normally done that you couldn't do because of uh, the restrictions that were placed on you? I think that's an interesting scene setter uh, for the committee. So, who would like to go first? Yes, Beatrice. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's a ah, we've lost you. You've gone. Just muted yeah. me. Yes, I'm back. There so, you go. There you, you go. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be with you today after so much work that we've been engaged with um, in Scotland, and we appreciate this opportunity. And I'm going to give a slight uh, introduction to the project and the background before we start having questions because we think it's important to set the scene. Fair enough. So if, if you don't mind, I'll take that opportunity now. Um, we, uh, what I wanted to cover is a little bit of the background, the methodology, the focus, and the findings. And um, it's important for us that you understand where, how we've been working with Scotland. We, we have a project at the OECD which focuses on implementing education policies because we've learned throughout the years that many countries fail to implement successfully their reforms because they don't focus well enough or deep enough into what is implementation. And so they design very beautiful policies, but then uh, you know the process of implementing them is not well focused. So it's important to, to really um, develop a comparative analysis on this and also to support countries on this process. So yeah. we've started about three years ago, we started a project and we've now worked with eight different OECD education systems, including Austria, Estonia, Ireland in their senior cycle review, Mexico, Norway, Scotland, Wales in their curriculum uh, review as well, and Iceland in their education strategy. So the lessons that we use are very comparative. Our approach is comparative and is based on all the knowledge that we have at the OECD in relation to um, a wide range of policies and education systems. And I think that's important for, to, to contextualize. In terms of the methodology that we use, we have a tried and tested methodology. So it's not only three years when we started the project, but we've been doing country reviews uh, for you know more than two decades. And I've personally been at the OECD for more than two decades now and have been, you know, doing reviews and working with countries in a way that is tried and tested and what we do. And it draws extensively on qualitative analysis and quantitative information and comparative analysis that we tailor to the countries. And the way we work is we, we the country prepare, prepares uh, background information for us. We do our own preliminary analysis of the data, of the research, of the literature, of anything that uh, Scotland or the country may have published or developed uh, that we gather ourselves. And uh, then we visit the country. So here, what we did is two visits, virtual visits to Scotland um, by video. So we had video interviews, which actually extended a lot longer than we would normally do regularly. Normally, we would travel to the country and meet all the different stakeholders that we ourselves advise the governments that we want to meet. So we have a list mm. of the key education stakeholders that we consider are important, and we exchange in developing this list. Uh, and what we do is balance you know, our timing needs with the, the possibility to meet everybody in a specific moment. So I look this list with the, with the government and then we meet them individually as a team. So we created a specific team that was um, Roman and myself and then Anne Looney and uh, Jan van 
Kristen Acker, who's a, a world-renowned curriculum expert, and, and Anne is an excellent academic, and she's actually now engaged with you in the continuation of these uh, recommendations. So we, we did two visits. The first visit was focused on policy, and so we met all the different stakeholders we considered together as important to meet. And those we were not able to meet, we actually furthered and continued and developed more interviews after the week that we spent in September um, virtually in Scotland. And the second meeting week was with schools. So we did actually visit schools. And, you know, normally we visit schools and we can only visit three, four, but this time, because it was virtual, we were actually able to visit more and meet more students because we gathered perspectives from different students across Scotland. So we focused on meeting with principals, with teachers, with students, with parents of uh, different uh, regions in Scotland. And then in addition, with our preliminary findings, we had webinars where we gathered the perspectives of um, of stakeholders on our preliminary mm -hmm. recommendations. In addition, we had um, the Scottish Practitioners Forum, whom we would meet every six weeks to review progress, to share with them, you know, the, the project and how things were evolving, to check with them as well, the preliminary findings. So we've been greatly engaged, although virtually, uh, with you to develop uh, the, the the final analysis and the recommendations that we that you have um, seen and that there's been a summary provided to you. So the process has taken a while, and um, in terms of the the pandemic, there were a number mm -hmm. of issues because we were negotiating with the government to do the review um, before the pandemic hit, and because we were so we had considered doing the review visits in June and the pandemic hit and it was no time to visit a school in June because nobody was in school. <laughs> and yeah. Teachers were really focused on something else and not on an OECD review. So we considered it, it was really not the appropriate time to visit a school or to engage in an analysis at a time where, you know, we would have just been in the middle of another, you know, very, uh, anguishing situation for many schools and many policymakers to see how to respond. So we um, moved the visit. We decided to have the visit in between September and December because we knew we had to deliver a report um, mm -hmm. or something in, in, in a specific time, and it was important for Scotland. So we delayed and thought that we would do it in person if it was possible. And, and then again in September, it wasn't possible. Really mm -hmm. so we did it on online. And then we did the analysis. So that was the methodology. Now the focus, as you know, it, initially it was only senior phase, but then um, there was a parliamentary request that we would focus on the whole system. And uh, the main question that uh, we were asked to focus on is CFE implemented in such a way to contribute positively to the education of all young people in Scotland. So the focus that was requested from us was on implementation and learning, attention to broad BGE and to senior phase, a focus on young people and learning at the centre, and, mm -hmm. and then the review was collaborative and inclusive with stakeholders as much as possible. So we started our, our uh, review, we focused, we looked at the PISA data, which was of great concern across Scotland. And one of the, I think one of the reasons why the review was requested and, and the concern that PISA data was declining, we saw that there's a decline, but it was also the case with many other OECD countries. We also saw that Scotland um, is among the leading countries in global competency proficiency actually, which measures these new types of schools that CFE is delivering. We also saw that in equity, Scotland is above average across OECD countries in terms of equity. And uh, we also saw something that is a concern, that is the amount of working time that teachers spend in front of a class, which is very mm -hmm. high in relation to other OECD countries, among, among the highest, actually. 
And then we also reviewed your own evidence on education outcomes, selected evidence. And it's actually, it was difficult to see what CFE delivers because there's so many different data points. And so you, you use PISA, but PISA is a one point in time for 15 year olds. And for us, the analysis was from three to 18. So PISA cannot give you the whole response on whether CFE is working well or not, especially with senior phase. But we saw that you have data on 95% positive destinations, uh, more than 90% of 16 uh, to 19 year olds participate in education, employment or training. And there's been a narrowing of the equity gap between the most and the least deprived areas. We also saw that in S3, 88% uh, expected literacy and 90% expected numeracy levels were covered. And we also saw that there was improved attainment in the SCQF 46, with the attainment gaps decreased between 2009, 2010 and, and uh, 2018 and 19. So we saw some of your own data that showed some kind of progress in education. And so this is the background. Then we looked at CFE and actually CFE has been in the making for many years, as you know, it started in 2004. And, uh, you know, we actually followed it at the OECD for a while. And, uh, you know, you initiated CFE statements were published and implementation started from 2010. So it's now 2021. It's more than 10 years since CFE was implemented or has been slowly being implemented and uh, and in many education systems actually, you know, they review curriculum every 10 years. So this is something that is quite interesting, you know, CFE is not new, there's been a lot of experience and so it was a good time actually to review. And uh, we, you know, you, you have the four main building blocks of CFE are the you have the four fundamental capacities, also children rights, eight curriculum areas and three interdisciplinary areas, assessment as an integral part and school based curriculum design. And you also have a number of priorities uh, to close the poverty related gap, prepare children for the future, raise standards and provide competency based education. So we we did see CFE as a pioneer among uh, education systems internationally because since you started CFE, many other systems have been implementing curriculum that focus on um, knowledge, skills and competencies. So actually many education systems internationally are watching and considering you a high performing education system. So, which is quite important for us. So this is why also we wanted to understand CFE. And we did find that there were a number of underlying tensions with CFE that were very important, which was the balance, the lack of balance or how between flexibility at the school level, system coherence, the one between depth and breadth, um, the focus on knowledge, skills and or competencies or all of them together, and then the alignment between student assessment and system evaluation. So with all these tensions, we we analyzed and I'll be finishing now, we developed a set of recommendations where we suggest that what's important is, first of all, to provide for all Scottish students a coherent learning experience between three and 18, which we don't see is the case now because there is a gap when they reach senior phase and move from really the CFE experience into testing and preparing for um, the end of the school testing. So we think it's important. And uh, there we said you need to reassess CFE's aspirational vision and against emerging trends in education and especially find a focus, a better focus on knowledge as well. The second to find a balance between depth and breadth to adapt the senior phase to the vision of CFE and continue building curricular capacity. The second area that we thought was quite uh, important, it was about collaboration and clarity in the roles of responsibilities for different stakeholders, and then to consolidate the institutional policy process 
for effective change. And I'll stop here because I see you want to ask me a question. Yeah. You. You've given us a tour de force of the of the report, uh, <laughs> which I appreciate. But can I ask you my question again? Um, the pandemic restricted your ability to come here. It would have restricted your ways, your way of doing business normally. I am assuming is that correct? You would normally have come. You would normally have been on the ground here. Uh, it, it's been a different experience, yes. Uh, yes, it's been a different experience, of course. Uh, we've been doing this with all education systems, not only Scotland, and trying to find the best ways possible to gather evidence without doing the best thing that would be being in Scotland. And yeah, it would have been better to have been here on the ground. I mean, are you satisfied with the diversity of the voices that you heard in the course of, 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 of building the report? Because, because you see, one of the one of the one of the aspects of the constructive feedback that's come after the publication of the report is that most of the people and organisations that you consulted with were either on Scottish government committees uh, or, 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 or had been on Scottish government committees or had developed or actually managed CFE and the so-called insider bodies. That's one of the that's one of the criticisms of the report. How do you respond to that? We have met all the different education stakeholders that have involved with CFE, been involved with CFE, and that have lived CFE and experienced CFE as students, as parents, as teachers, and as policymakers. So, of course, we need to meet with the policymakers who did shape the policy, but we've also mm -hmm. met with academics who've analyzed and critiqued the policy, a number of them, and uh, with many observers and uh, different representatives from different bodies and institutions across Scotland. Of course, CFE is a policy that covers the whole education system. So we, you know, we've met uh, a quite a, we think, a representative set of um, stakeholders uh, across I... Scotland that ma matches the type of stakeholders that we would meet in any other education system. Oh, okay, that's a fair response. Um, can I ask you about changes that were made to the report between the draft and the final report? Were there changes made to the draft at the request of the Scottish Government or any of the educational agencies? Um, so, in the, the process for us is always the same with countries. We, you know, it's a quite an intricate uh, process to develop these reports these reports and we you know we gather the data then we go back and meet with all the different uh, the team and um, review how we see review the evidence and then draft the report and have one preliminary version and this preliminary version goes to a number of people internally at the OECD and also externally in the country because we believe it's important to get the facts right we're mm -hmm. observers not Scottish and you know there's and the education system and the assessment system in Scotland is very confusing <laughs> and so we we it's important to <laughs> that's an interesting that. comment yeah. you've just made it is very confusing it's well it's it's complex not confusing complex so so we want we always do this with all countries we send a draft a preliminary draft for comments and review to to check that all the the facts are right, that we have it well done. So, and normally the process is we have a national coordinator and we send, we exchange just with that person and that person is in charge of gathering all the different feedback uh, within the country and giving it back to us. Because if the OECD was to open their mailbox to everybody in the country, it would be unmanageable for us. So. There is the, the so it's fair to say. Sorry, I don't wish to be rude, but I'm going to bring my colleagues in now. Um, but, but it's fair to say that, that, that there were changes between the draft and the final report that we have in front of us. Yes, of course there is. It is fair to say, so and it's also, yeah that we have a preliminary report, and then we get you know comments from. Uh, for, we got comments from the staff at the OECD from Education 2030, who have a yeah. good understanding of curriculum internationally, from you, from other observers. So, yes, and then we ourselves as a team review 
the report and have a, and prepare a final draft. And that's how mm. any academic would work. A first draft is never a final draft. Uh, thank you for that. Now, we probably this is process related questions. We may come back to more of these, but I'm going to bring in Ross Greer at this point, who, and I hope we might be able to bring in Roman as well. Uh, I'm conscious of the fact we've not heard from her yet. Uh, Ross Greer. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning. Much of the commentary here in Scotland in, in the last few days around the report has been uh, in regards to the references made uh, both in the report itself, but also at the launch uh, back in June to Scottish National Standardised Assessments, the, the ACEL assessments. Rather than put words into your mouth, could, could I ask you to expand on what was said in the report about SNSAs and specifically is their purpose clear, and do you believe that the standardised assessments are meeting that stated purpose at present? Um, I will let Roman will take that question and respond to you. Thank you, Roman. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, and uh, thank you, Ms. P. Greer, I think, for your question. Uh, may I just clarify, you, you are talking about the SNSA, correct? Correct, yes. Thank you, at least. Um, so, what the report is uh, the bringing SNSA for is when we are considering the data available to monitor progress of students with Curriculum for Excellence. And it's um, linked to what we were saying earlier, which was a dual uh, observation on our part that there is both a lot of data generated, but maybe not the relevant or appropriate data for the purpose of monitoring um, curriculum for excellence um, effect on student learning. So uh, I'll, I'll be short on this part, but the SNSA is bring in is brought in, sorry, as an example, aside with um, the curriculum for excellence levels. I think the acronym for that one is ASL, and we're considering the um, the relevance of each of those uh, to data collection mechanisms compared with what we would want to see for curriculum for excellence, um, for a monitoring system for curriculum for excellence. So the, rash, the, the argument that is made is not that SNSA in particular is to scrap or is useless. It is just that it is maybe not the most appropriate mechanism to use for curriculum for excellence or to measure curriculum for excellence um, impact on student learning. Did that answer your question, MSP? Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, a slight uh, delay there with the, the microphone. If I could just go a little bit further into that, the, the SNSAs have a, a dual purpose. They're supposed to collect both formative and summative data. So, uh, th their stated purpose is to both help individual teachers with supporting their pupils, but also to provide that larger summative data about how the system as a whole is working. The point that you've just made that they're not necessarily the best way to collect this data, can I just clarify, is that the summative data that you're talking about? The SNSAs are not necessarily the best way to collect system level data. It's not necessarily the best system level data for curriculum for excellence's impact on student learning. So I, I really emphasize the last this last part of my sentence in that um, the what we were suggesting that CFE would need in terms of data collection would be some sort of study um, that would that would have a focus really on student experiences of curriculum and assessment their experience and their suggestions about uh, the qualifications linked to those assessments, something that would look at the diversity of what Curriculum for Excellence is trying to achieve, rather than what is currently um, measured via the SNSA, because the, the fact that it has this dual purpose makes it maybe a little, a little less relevant for CFE as a policy. Thank you. And it's, sorry. 
Please do go on. No, no, that, <laughs> that's all right. That's, uh, the information centre here at the Scottish Parliament, which is the, the neutral research resource available to all of us, so it's not aligned with any one individual party, has just published a little bit more an analysis on this. And they've highlighted um, the, the potential difference between the Scottish Government accepting the headline recommendations of your report and responding to the wider commentary contained within it. And this is the, the example used, because the, there's not a headline recommendation specifically on SNSAs, but there is this wider commentary, exactly as, as you've just explained, about whether or not they are the um, most useful way to collect the data that is required. Would you expect the Scottish Government to respond directly to the, the points made around SNSAs? Thank you, Mr. Greer, for this question. We, um, you know, we at the OECD are an independent organization, and what we do is deliver a set of recommendations for um, the countries to take on board and consider what, you know, what Scotland will do with our recommendations then is up to your political process and to your discussions. So we provide, we try to provide the most uh, fair and independent and objective recommendations, and also to provide a development of why and what options could be adopted and how these could be and provide examples of other countries that do similar um, you know, types of policy. So the next step for Scotland is to consider how you want to move on board with the recommendations. And for us, it's, it's a summary. The recommendations are a summary um, to guide the action, but it's important to take all of these on board coherently and uh, as part of the whole um, CFE experience for students and for teachers, actually. And uh, Roman was explaining for us the assessment system is not fully uh, providing information about how CFE is succeeding. It's more focused on the knowledge aspect and there's three other capacities that are not, you know, they don't appear in, in, in the data. And so when you try to understand how, how CFE is progressing, the only focus is on, or, or the more limited focus is on the knowledge side, but not the other. So we think it's important to consider that. But that's up to Scotland to see how you want to take on board our recommendations. We, we don't you know, we cannot tell Scotland what they should be doing. Thank you both. That's all for me for now, Convener. Yes, thank you, Ross. I think I gather from your answers, uh, Beatrice, that the text underneath the subheadings is part of the recommendation in the report. That's what my understanding from your answer is, um, unless I'm misunderstanding. I want to bring Fergus Ewing in now. He has a follow-up question, and then we'll come to Willie Rennie. Thank you, convener, and good morning to, to both witnesses. Thank, thank you for, for coming along this morning. I just wanted to pursue the issue which Mr. Greer has, has raised, and you have both already covered, namely data and the absence of sufficient data to enable us to determine the, um, the, up, the, the outcome, the success of three of the four competencies under CFE. Uh, and I did notice, and I was going to quote from your report, but I think you've already confirmed that some data is missing, some data is absent, and I, I fully accept it's for Scotland to, to respond to this, but can you give us a little bit more help in identifying what type of data you think we should be getting, from whom, and how other countries uh, are dealing with this reportage, if you like, on data to assess how their children are responding in, in respect of key competencies. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Ewing. Uh, this is, I mean, it's a very large question to which many countries are actually grappling with because, you know, the, the three um, capacities outside of, of successful learners are, are more difficult to assess, and many countries are wondering how to do this. 
we've actually, um, in addition to our report, we developed a working paper on student assessment in, in upper secondary education, which is senior phase in, in Scotland, and in a comparative perspective, because uh, the government suggested that this is an area that they also wanted us to focus on, but it was not for recommendations, but rather just to provide some options for the future. And so Professor Gordon Stobart developed a working paper on the current assessment system and how it could be better aligned to CFE. And so he provides some options to move beyond what, what he called the legacy system of, uh, of student assessment in Scotland. And these options vary, but they, they focus on developing more resilient upper secondary assessment, uh, a, a more resilient assessment system that has been, you know, it's been hit by the pandemic and there's been a number of issues and there's other education systems internationally who have been more resilient because they have a mixed, what he calls a mixed economy of, um, of student assessment approaches. And, uh, and so how do you align better student assessment with curriculum and pedagogy? So you have to broaden how you assess. Some may be school-based assessment by teachers, uh, other by using IT means to measure other types of skills that are not necessarily hardcore knowledge. Um, and um, so he develops a number of uh, examples of different countries and how they're doing this and brings in Norway, New Zealand, uh, Australia and others who are uh, introducing or have tested and used successfully different approaches that go beyond the pen and pencil test and that you yourselves have been actually introducing through the SQM more. So, you know, you already have some experience on this and this is where many countries are moving towards. Uh, we, when we virtually traveled across uh, Scotland and we met some parents and we asked them, you know, how do you see the impact of CFE on your children? And many said, well, they speak much better, they are much more open about their views and they can very cogently discuss and introduce many topics in our dinner table and I see a change. Many, but it's such anecdotal evidence so, and that's not enough to understand um, CFE. So it, it is important to try to find right ways of measuring all these additional skills that, that CFE is focused on and that many education systems internationally are increasingly focused on. Mm. Could I thank you very much for that answer? It's extremely helpful. And I, I was very interested in your reference to the comments that some parents have made, albeit anecdotal evidence, because it absolutely accords with my own impression of listening to parents that their children are well able to express themselves with confidence, with greater confidence than perhaps was the case when I was at school, although that, although that was a very long time ago. Thank you. We did. That's what we heard quite quite often, actually. Many saying, "Well, you know, we so so we were hearing critique, but then anecdotal evidence that there's a certain set of skills that CFE is developing, and that they're perceived, you know, anecdotally by um, by those who are observing the system and participating in it, and even children as well." Uh, one other issue that I wanted to highlight as well is that we we met with a number of students and even we met a student who had dropped out, who had lack of confidence, who was a very disadvantaged student and she was wonderful telling us about how she had been bullied and how she got out of it and, and a number of personal experiences of different students that were very relevant to us as well to understand how CFE can help students. And we thought that there was not enough uh, engagement of students to understand their views in Scotland. Well, that's an interesting comment to lead us to Willie Rennie. Willie. But there does seem to be quite a significant debate that we need to have about the overall measurement, not just of the system to help politicians in the national debate, but also uh, in the classroom as well. 
And I think your report is quite clear in the discussion that you think using the SNSA, the assessment process um, for broad general education, for national stake. Um, can I just be clear? It's, it's following on from what Ross Greer was asking. Um, that, that it shouldn't be used for national monitoring purposes, and there needs to be a different process. Now, of course, you've also talked about the um, separation um, of the. Sorry, something happened here. We still hear you. Yeah, we can uh, still hear you, Willie. We can uh, still hear you. Sorry, but sorry, my screen, my yeah. screen has gone funny. Um, so the. Um, so I understand the point about the fact that SNSAs are narrowly, narrowly focusing on just one of the capacities, and that needs to change. But there are two separate issues here. We need to have that national monitoring separate from the assessment process. Am I understanding it correctly? And you need to send a very clear message to us that SNSAs are not suitable for national monitoring purposes. Um, Beatrice, did you get that question? Yes, I did will you? ask Roman if she wants to take this question. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Rennie, for your, your question. I, I did get a little bit of um, white noise, so I'm I'll just I'll just repeat what I understood from your question. So your your question is whether um, we can say that SNSA, the SNSA is not fit for monitoring purposes, system monitoring purposes. Is that correct? Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. That's right. Thank you, sir. So, as I was uh, saying, our our uh, recommendations and our suggestions are only based on curriculum for excellence. So, we cannot, and the report does not uh, pronounce itself on the broader part of the, the education system, which we didn't assess SNSA for. So I can only speak to what the SNSA, um, the, how it connects to Curriculum for Excellence and its attempts. And this is stated rather quick, uh, clearly in the report that the SNSA is not considered by our team as um, the, the most appropriate um, uh, system monitoring uh, mechanism as far as CFE is concerned. But it is, again, uh, I'll, I'll highlight this part, is that SNSA is cited alongside um, at least one other um, uh, monitoring tool that was developed, that was the, the Curriculum for Excellence uh, levels. So it is cited as one example and only uh, with regards to CFE. Willie, you want to come back in? Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's clear um, because it, what you have just said isn't included in your main recommendations, and I think my fear is that the the government won't address this substantially. And I I understand the purpose of the SNSAs for te to assist the teacher and the classroom process, but to be clear, it's not really suitable. As it's currently used um, on a national monitoring basis. That's what I just want to be absolutely clear about. Roman? Yes, if I may say, I, I the, the points that I referred to are actually included in uh, in the in the main recommendations. Uh, no, the no, recommendation number three, um, which is about the. Uh, the alignment between the curriculum qualifications and system evaluation um, part. So, so this this point, and again, SNSA as an example, and only with regard to CFE, is cited as part of this recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And Roman, just to go back to the point that I made earlier, the text underneath the subheadings in the report—that's all part of. They, they, they are part of the recommendations. I, I, I said earlier that I concluded from your previous answer that they were. You seem to have suggested that again. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. So as yes. go ahead, Roman. Go ahead. 
No, I, was, I was actually going to say, as, as Beatrice was saying earlier, uh, indeed, the text beneath the recommendations are part of the recommendations, and the OECD is not expecting uh, a government to take every single point, point by point, and provide a response or an action immediately, but rather to use the, the whole of the text and the, the guiding that. points that we provide in terms of recommendations. So that because those recommendations cannot be understood or interpreted outside of the context we provide with the broader text. That is exceptionally clear. Thank you very much on that. Um, I'm going to go to um, Michael Mara. He wanted to come in on another topic. Could I clarify very quickly? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Thank you. Beatrice, we'll, we'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, Beatrice, would you like to just you wanted to clarify something? Just, you know, we have a generic overall recommendation number three, and then underneath we have, you know, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. Yeah. And the recommendations suggest align curriculum qualifications and system evaluation to deliver on the commitment of building the curriculum five, which is a document that you yeah. yourself prepared a while ago. And underneath is the text to develop this recommendation and to consider how to yeah. do it. So it helps develop and consider. So you're confirming what Roman has, has just said, which is much appreciated. I'm going to go now to Michael Mara. Michael. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I found all of that commentary on uh, the assessments very useful indeed. Uh, I, I want to take um, perhaps Dr Pont back to um, comments she made earlier regarding uh, the work that they have done internationally um, and the development of other systems. It's, it's great to hear other countries um, are observing Scotland. Uh, but I want to try and learn a little bit about um, from those other countries as well. Um, Dr. Pont mentioned that other countries have implemented new curriculums which share the same kind of ethos as Curriculum for Excellence. Um, I wonder if you could make some comment on uh, what implementation issues those countries have faced that may be similar to those we've had here in Scotland, and but also are there any issues which are distinct to us here in Scotland? Um. Thank you very much. This is a very um, interesting question for us. And uh, we, since you started CFE, there's been a number of countries, Norway, Finland, Estonia, New Zealand, Japan, and Wales, for example, have all introduced curriculum reforms that go into what we consider this term of 21st century skills and competencies and knowledge. And, and so many are you know, adding transversal skills of different and values, and more recently Iceland as well. So they're introducing these values that you have in your four purposes. So we have watched many countries introduce this. We have a broader OECD project covering this with a framework that is similar to yours. And, um, you know, we've only watched a few who have been implementing it. And and um, one of the issues I think is, is teacher preparation um, and uh, teacher development of curriculum. And in your own case, you know, where teachers have to create, shape their own curriculum at the local level, that requires a specific type of skills that maybe teachers may not be fully um, prepared for in their own initial teacher training programs or um, or, or have time in schools to do that. So we find that uh, that is a big issue. There's high expectations for teachers, but um, it's important really to to build curricular capacity at various levels of the system. And th this happens internationally. We had an example of Mexico who introduced a curriculum, um, skills-based curriculum, and then they delivered an online training for one day they you know to many teachers to start the course and so i think you've been investing more in developing capacity and many systems are developing different approaches to provide capacity for teachers uh, the second big issue so that's the first i mean if you you define a, a very good curriculum but it's still very difficult to implement it at the school level uh, by the teachers and, and by the principals. The second one is about student assessment, and we've been now discussing it um, in a number of questions that you've posed to us and, and how to align 
you know, what we call this um, 21st century skill curriculum with 19th century assessment systems. And many countries are upgrading or changing or, or seeing how to review their assessment systems. And actually COVID has provided an opportunity to do so because, you know, they had to be cancelled and there, we had to find different ways of, of delivering information on how students are progressing. And so we've seen France or Norway or other systems, you know, giving greater weight of um, teacher-based assessments or school-based assessments or others. Uh, and then the third is finding the right system monitoring mechanisms that allow to understand how progress uh, with curriculum is moving forward. And then an, a, a last one that we also um, cover in your report is the institutional aspect of who, you know, how, how should it be reviewed, how often it should be reviewed, and who should be reviewing it. And uh, we found that in Scotland it was still, you know, that we thought it was important to have a professional process for reviewing CFE rather than ad hoc. Um, system. So we recommended that there should be an institution such as that in Ireland that could review um, the curriculum in a set cycle and take on board issues that may, arri may arise throughout the years in, in a process that is professional and formal. So those are more or less uh, an overview of some of the, the challenges in implementation of curriculum. I think there, there may be others, but, um, you know, I'll stop here, and I don't know. If Michael, do you want to come back in? Yeah, th th thanks, Kavira. Um, I think some. Of the, I suppose it's a very broad question. I understand that, Dr. Point, in terms of, the, and I suppose probably um, might be uh, require a, a broader analysis in some of those issues. I mean, you mentioned Mexico in terms of maybe um, the uh, lack of um, preparing or lack of um, training for teachers to do the kind of curriculum development. I mean, some of that, I think, would be familiar to teachers in Scotland at the start of Curriculum for Excellence in terms of the great challenges in the implementation phase. And are there places that have done that better? And are there, are there lessons that we can learn? So you've given us one instance that where things haven't gone well, perhaps in, in Mexico, in terms of a lack of that capacity. Are you saying that we need to really lift that? And what kind of capacity? I mean, you, you make reference, I suppose, to your, one of your core issues regarding the in-school development time. But are there instances? What are the where are the models we should be reflecting on and learning from? Uh, one of them is your neighbour, Wales. We've been working with Wales, and Wales has been following you in a way in in developing a new curriculum, and they will start implementing it for from uh, 2023. And they are aiming to develop a professional learning system for teachers, very much engaging them at the local level and providing the right training and the right networks for them. And they have a set of consortia that will be their that that are their school improvement partners in a way like your regional collaboratives, but a bit more formalized. And that's the role that they provide. And I think that's at the core. We're also working with Norway. Norway introduced a decentralized funding scheme to um, develop a collaborative approach for training and capacity building at the local and school level and actually are allowing, and they're giving this money. It's kind of a complex system, but it's a, it's a savvy system where they're giving money for schools to make their demands um, met by universities, but only if universities tailor their own training, because sometimes universities have their packaged, ready-made training that doesn't fully help teachers. So they're changing the way things are in, in setting up a collaborative approach to developing the right responses for teachers' needs. And that's a good approach as well uh, that is very that that we've been working with and it's but it's you know it's slow it takes time and it's a process you know and uh, you yourself have um, the partnerships between universities and schools on professional inquiry and I think this you know these types of regional and local approaches to supporting schools and their staff to work together 
to solve their issues and develop themselves and their own capacity, are, we find are working well internationally. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I'm going to turn now to Bob Doris. Bob. Thank you very much, convener. And it's been a, a fascinating evidence session uh, so, so far. Um, I was wanting to ask a few questions in relation to some of the recommendations about the what was discussed a mismatch between the senior phase of school and and and, and curriculum for for, for excellence. Um, uh, one of the things that was raised was there was a, a too narrow a range of, of of learning activities in the senior phase. I'm keen to know what what you think might be improved. How you would broaden that out. Um, and there's much talk about a diversity of pathways being 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 required, um, and also a lack of time to go into detail in in, in some subjects. So I, I, I'm just wondering, first about the the, the the range of learning activities, but also in terms of going into detail in some subjects. The suggestion to be by OECD, if I've got it correctly, that there should be a limited amount of core subjects in the senior phase, and then some subjects where Students begin to much more specialist detail, and I'm just wondering, and I'm open-minded on that, whether or not that might have an unintended consequence to actually narrow uh, the options of young people in the senior phase. So, I'd be interested to know uh, your comments on that. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Doris. This is, I mean, it's quite a large question that you're posing, and we, you know, we analyzed senior phase, and what we saw that there was a, a, a gap or a, a jump between the aspirations of CFE that are met in um, BGE, but then when you jump to uh, senior phase, it, some have termed it the two-term dash of exams. For students to get their qualifications and, and leave the system, and and so there are all these you know student assessments, and and the structures are very set to pass the exams, but not to have a broad experience as CFE uh, considers it. So we we think that that's hindering the curriculum experience of many. Young people, and actually, the students that we met told us this. Well, you know, we, we arrive into senior phase having learned in a new way and having learned in a, in a much more broader experience type of approach, and now we have to go back to learning for the test. And that's, um, that's something that they were saying, you know, it changes the way they perceive education. And so we, we think, you know, Senior phase has an issue between breadth and depth that it's still unsolved and it's a tension. And uh, we think that uh, that a possibility would be to clarify the structure of senior phase. So without restricting its diversity, because there's quite a objective or that we heard of being diverse and providing as many opportunities for young children as possible. And that was an issue that many highlighted to us, but then that may be too broad and not deep enough. But uh, so we we thought that a possibility that's, that without restricting the diversity, it could be to define a number of typical pathways or profiles for upper set for senior phase uh, without a limited number of compulsory courses or specialization courses and providing room for additional or optional units. So. So that there would be some guidance from the system as to what would be the expectations, and uh, we also welcome the the provision of of um, courses by colleges. You know, students can take courses in colleges, and colleges also provide courses in schools as well. And it was a, a very interesting model that we valued greatly in terms of being able to provide a range of opportunities for students to widen their learning experience at, at their, um, as they are teenagers. Oh, I, come back in. Okay. Yeah, so that's, um, that, that's very helpful. And I absolutely recognise the, the two-term dash. And uh, 
I don't think the OEC has been prescriptive in how that, that gets fixed. Some schools obviously do NAT 5s or higher over two years. Currently, so they pace out the, the curriculum and syllabus at a much more um, appropriate scale uh, and pace for students currently. So I get that. And the additional provision, further education, dropping down into schools already happening, expanding those 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 pathways and, and broadening that out. I absolutely get that. I also, I suppose this were my follow-up question would be in relation to assessments, and I, and I see in the report much more use of portfolio work, much more use of continuous assessment, much more use in teacher judgment, of course, with appropriate moderation. And I also see that some, some of that moderation for continuous assessment be external to the school also, to build in much more chunky checks and balances in the system. So a lot there to, to welcome. But I suppose my question around that would be, in years gone by, and I'm thinking of the poverty-related attainment gap here, is when you give more content for young people to produce, young people that have better support at home for preparing for their work at home can quite often be young people from more um, high-income backgrounds uh, and, 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 and uh, more, more, more time and space at home and tutors and that kind of thing. So is there... I support all of this, but would we have to be careful that when we broaden out that continuous assessment, that what we don't do is put an uh, inbuilt advantage again, as we have with external assessment uh, for a cohort of young people uh, who maybe are better placed to take those those benefits of continuous assessment because of tutors and parental support and all those kind of additional advantages that they have. Yes, I think the equity dimension is very important in CFE and uh, in Scotland. And you already perform, according to PISA, have a higher equity than other education systems than the average. And uh, some of your data also show that you've managed to reduce slightly some of the gaps between uh, low and high socioeconomic background. And uh, we were concerned that CFE, when you um, devolve so much to schools uh, to develop the curriculum and to choose the pathways that, uh, and to see which courses to be offered, that the more uh, advantaged, privileged schools will have a broader array of offers, of supply, of courses, of you know, and that can actually lead to higher inequality. So. It's important for Scotland to consider the issue of, of inequality and, and how CFE really can be provided for all schools and for all children to benefit from. So we, um, when you assess students externally, you know, which system is fairer? There's been a discussion, you know, what's fair? Do our student, external student assessments, people think that they're fairer because they, you know, they're the same for everybody, but um, that hasn't been demonstrated to be true. And we've seen that in the US with the SATs, which have been dropped in many places because they've been considered to be unfair because students, as you say, don't have the same capacity to prepare at home. Um, so it's important to have the right support mechanisms for schools to be able to support their students. And if they have more disadvantaged schools to have more support if possible and the right conditions for them to thrive. Now, sometimes teachers are in a better position to support their students and uh, continuous assessment by teachers and by their schools can actually be fairer than an exam that where there's no support or no individual knowledge of these students. So, so what we consider important to have a balance of this, not necessarily to, to drop one or the other, but to make sure that schools have provision and uh, support students have the right support mechanisms for them um, and, um, and that these assessments are well balanced so you can have a good understanding of the performance of students. Thank, thank you, and thank you, and thank you, Bob. I'm going to turn now to Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I wanted to return to the original uh, line of question uh, that you started. Uh, I have very serious concerns uh, that uh, this report uh, is flawed; that it hasn't 
uh, engaged properly with non-ministry academics. Um, I've written twice to the OECD um, and not even got a reply. Um, and when I asked the Scottish Government um, after a freedom of information request uh, which non-ministry academics were suggested uh, to the OECD, uh, they told me that a planned phone call uh, to discuss additional participants did not take place. So I would be interested to know how non-ministry academics were suggested uh, and where the view uh, that CFE uh, was universally um, embraced in Scotland had come from. Um, thank you for your comment and your question. We, I do not know if you were there when I introduced the methodology. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yes, I was, but I was not really satisfied um, because my understanding was the OECD had written a paper um, and sent it through to Scottish Government officials um, that discussed who would participate um, in, in, in the review. Um, and one of the questions in that paper uh, was around which additional non ministry academics should be approached. And the Scottish mm -hmm. Government and the OECD have been unable to tell me uh, you know, who, who was discussed. Um, you know, and, 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 and why you chose uh, why you chose particular individuals, um, and it confuses me because there are a number of voices in Scottish education uh, who have you know, more fundamental concerns about the curriculum for excellence and the principles behind it. Um, so we, we, as I said at the beginning, we have a set methodology, and we say we in all countries we meet a group of academics. And one of the issues we have is time constraints. We cannot uh, have, you know, visit all the academics in the country, and our time is limited, and the report have to be out. So we ask for a select set of academics who can be either critical or or supporter. And we've met, we've approached RSC, for example, the Royal Scottish, and Kerr Bloomer, and uh, others and met a number of them. But if we did not meet them, we actually read their papers, all their criticism and uh, support. So whether we have met them or not, we have covered uh, much of the territory of the critical aspects of CFE written by many um, Scottish academics. So to tell you the truth, I, I am not in, I cannot remember the specific you know, exchange about the academics because we, you know, we we provide a, a list, we provide a guidance of who we want to meet, and then we exchange and then define a final set of five to ten academics that we want to meet. And because it was online, it was a bit more challenging to have a large group of academics. Normally, for example, I've been in Sweden in a room with twelve academics, or and uh, there are always fascinating um, sessions as well. And here uh, we met a number of them, either as a group or also met them individually later when we could. Um, with this request for information, you know, the OECD, we have a, a set process that works for all countries, and um, it's sound, it's uh, independent and objective, and we we stand by that. We. Apparently, Lindsay Patterson was among our shortlist, but it was not possible to fit him. So we read his publication as well. And uh, there, you know, the other issue is that we, as I said, we ask our national coordinator to coordinate for us and to, you know, send us all the information so that we don't open ourselves up to receiving so much uh, information that we can be overloaded and. Uh, and um, so I think we covered a good set of academic perspectives, whether we met them or we read the materials uh, initially or during the review. So that's uh, how, how we see the situation. Oliver, Mundell. I mean, I, quite frankly, I find it shocking that the OECD did not have time uh, to speak to Professor Patterson, uh, I think he's widely regarded uh, in Scotland uh, by Scottish teachers, uh, you know, by by, by uh, parents, uh, by many um, across uh, academia, uh, and you know the idea that as one of the leading critics uh, of of the current uh, curriculum, uh, that his voice wouldn't be included, um, and and that his papers would only be read, I, I think confirms 
uh, many of the concerns uh, I've uh, got. Um, and you know, I, I just feel the, the, the curriculum skirts over uh, some of the issues around knowledge. Um, you know, it, pushes, it pushes the point, but it does not actually question whether the capacities at the heart of CFE um, are actually what, what causes the problem. Um, and you know, I, I think, uh, you know, as a result, the, the report is, is, is less than, than it would have been. But I don't, um, I, I don't really need an answer to that. Convener, I'm happy to, to let other members come in. I think um, on that point. It, oh, sorry. Did, yes. We did uh, approach RSC and we met Kerr Bloomer, um, so we got the perspective of the uh, RSC, and uh, that's. It. I think. I think James Dornan, did you want to come I in? Was, on this uh, with respect, convener, I, Keir Bloomer wasn't happy with the process either, um, and he said that it's very evident uh, that it's been stage managed by the government. So I, I don't think it's right to, to reference him as a as a defence for for not having taken the time to speak to Professor Patterson. Right. Thank you, Oliver. I think that point's thank been made. Um, I think I think James Dornan, did you want to come in on this particular line? I did, yeah. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I just say that I found the, the last intervention highly embarrassing for the committee. It, the OECD is an internationally respected organisation. All of us seem to have this conspiracy theory that the Scottish Government have got power over all sorts of international bodies, and that if they do not do exactly as, as, as he wants, then there is some well, conspiracy let's... going on to make sure that the, world, the government is, is unacceptable for the OECD to be coming here in good faith, taking questions, and then getting that type of abuse from a member well, who is trying James, to make a point. James, James Dornan, um, I'm not sure that we could say what was occurred. There was abuse, but your point is made. Would you like to make a further point to the OECD? No, I, to, to be fair, the evidence I, I've heard so far has been pretty good. There's, there's obviously there's clear issues about the final stages, but I was wondering about the the fact that we're talking about the apprenticeships being part of the the end of the process. I wonder how the OECD. I know that they didn't write the report on that, but I wonder uh, the upper secondary assessment. I wonder how the the work of the integrating the foundation apprentices, how they see that best being built on, and how. The existing mindsets might be shifted to make sure that that works easier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dornan. Um, we thank you for your comments. And regarding apprenticeships, we actually uh, don't. Um, we did not cover the apprenticeships specifically. We welcome the openness of CF. Of CFE and senior phase to to develop other qualifications focused more on expanding the pathways and the capacities for students to develop professional um, training and, and vocational education and training and and uh, apprenticeships are one way. There is actually another report by the OECD on apprenticeships by a different department, and uh, I think I'll be happy to send that along to the committee. If you want to read further on it, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, turning now to Stephanie Kala. Stephanie. Thank you. Sorry, couldn't get myself off mute there. Uh, someone else appears to have done it for me. Um, I was really quite interested as well in the kind of alignment of uh, business links and links into universities um, and colleges and working collaboratively with them. Could you expand on that, please? Um, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, um, I'm really interested in um, the links um, into colleges and universities and what they're actually looking for. And I was wondering if you could expand on that. Thanks. So what universities are looking for from students coming in from uh, CFE? Yes. In terms of um, the skills and the knowledge and skills? That yes. whether CFE is suitable for universities, according to universities. So, really, um, 
what work I suppose is it that we need to do um, between schools and universities to actually support what it is that colleges and universities are actually looking for from our young people, the skills and stuff that they want to see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Callahan. Um, so, uh, we did meet a number of university rectors and, and heard their views on the types of skills that students should have. And more broadly, at the OECD, we, you know, we are considering that, you know, students need knowledge, skills, values and uh, that are important to develop as to participate and contribute effectively in their societies and uh, in shaping their own future. And um, the skills developed in CFE we see are quite important in that sense. And um, universities are, you know, they are also looking to see in this way of assessing how students are ready for them, it's important. So universities internationally are also changing the way they assess or they they gather evidence to understand the skills that the students have. And they also there's there are also efforts to expand how universities get involved in shaping the curriculum. We think it's important as well that uh, they they should be consulted in the process and uh, contribute to you know to shape curriculums for the future now i i i can't go more in detail here because i think we did not cover this very much in depth in our report but there is a whole uh, team at the oecd also working in in tertiary education that i can also um, request information from and send it forward to you thank you Thank you. Would you like to come back in, Stephanie? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm going to um, turn now to my deputy uh, convener, um, Kokab Stewart. Kokab. Um, hi there. Um, thank you very much. Um, I've listened with great interest. Um, uh, just to sort of declare an interest to you, I've been a teacher for 30 years. So a lot of what you've been saying um, actually resonates quite a lot. Um, I first started teaching when we had the 5 to 14 curriculum, so I was at the beginning of the implementation of the curriculum for excellence. So it's been interesting for me to track that journey of implementation and now review um, at this time. Um, it's great to hear that other countries are following our pioneering sort of curriculum for excellence. Um, as a previous teacher, I would agree that it does provide uh, sort of like avenues for children to express, for instance, their talking and listening skills. And I think you referred to that when you were feeding back that children are much more articulate, that they're able to debate and put their views across. So, you know, active citizens um, and responsible learners, you know, the four capacities, I'm very familiar with those. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable that after this amount of time, it would now require refinement and we have to adapt for the future, which, you know, now, especially in the context of COVID, um, lots of things have changed, uh, you know, especially regarding skills um, that we are, you know, different balances of skills that we're needing in the future. I note that uh, the statistic of 95% of positive destinations, um, I think that reinforces the fact that you have uh, university colleges um, as well as apprenticeships. Um, so there's a wide range of uh, you know positive pathways for our young people. So I was glad to see that. Also, I noted the narrowing of the equity gap and the narrowing of the attainment gap. Um, in Scotland, you may have noticed that we do suffer sometimes from the Scottish cringe a wee bit, and we can do do down education um, and certain other things, and we don't celebrate our successes as much. So, can I just clarify that, uh, in your opinion, and in the report's opinion, that Scotland's education is performing well, and it is internationally regarding, and that our education isn't going backwards, because sometimes you know, teachers get quite upset, and so do parents and 
uh, pupils as well get quite upset when we hear that narrative um, that Scottish education isn't that great. Uh, so, yeah, th those were the, the main comments. With regards to the census, I would totally agree with what's in the report. As a practitioner, I found that they were not measuring properly the actual skills that we were teaching. Um, and what I also found was that disadvantaged children, uh, they were even further disadvantaged because the context of uh, the examples in the questions did not resonate with children who came from sort of poorer backgrounds, for instance. Um, you know, they would set stories in castles. Or, well, in Scotland, that's not a good example. We have lots of castles. Um, but I think you get my point. <laughs> you get my general point. Um, so, yeah, uh, that, that's my overall thing. So, thank you very much. It's been really interesting. So, just a wee bit back from you about Scotland standing in education internationally and across Europe. Uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Coca. Yes, that, that's going to be very interesting. Yes, Beatrice. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, for us, uh, we see Curriculum for Excellence has expanded the opportunities for Scottish learners to thrive, and uh, it has broadened the you know, the, cap the, the four capacities we find are very uh, relevant to the future. And uh, still, we think that it's important to further invest in it. But internationally, you are watched an, as an example of high performance. And, uh, and uh, we, we, you know, in the data, when we compare with other countries, you're above the average in a number of indicators. And especially in the new one on global competencies at the OECD, which measures these types of skills, Scotland was a very high performer there. So there are, you know, you are being watched internationally. We actually had a webinar to launch this um, report in June, and we had more than 1,000 participants logging in internationally, not only from Scotland, but actually we had from the four corners of the world who want to hear you know, what is Scotland doing and how are you um, developing your curriculum? So for us, you know, policy is always needs to be reviewed. You can't have a policy that stays fit and you, you're not going backwards. You need to review for the future. And so it's important to continue the effort and to make sure you're always reviewing it and updating it and, and making sure that it's fit for purpose. As our societies change, our education systems need to reflect this, and it's very important uh, that you do so. So this is how we looked at CFE on the need, you know, after 10 years of implementation, you need to still review it professionally and see what's still working, what can be improved, and define a good process that is institutionalized to do so. So, um, thank you very much for, for this question. I'll bring, I'm going to bring back COCAP. It, it was just to ask whether um, I, I totally agree that you know we need to refine. Um, do you think that we are in a good place uh, to be able to move forward in you know many of the areas that you said? Do you think that? Uh, our structures are going to be fit for that purpose. We're going to be able to do that. <laughs> this is a difficult question. <laughs> are your structures? We're providing a set of recommendations to have to consolidate the structures to make curriculum for excellence less political and more policy oriented. We find that at present the politics overtake uh, the policy. And it's important. That's why we think it's important to have the right institutional structure so that um, CFE is professionally reviewed in an institution that has the experts to do so and consults externally with all the different stakeholders to be able to do so. So that for us, I mean, you have the will. You obviously, the whole system is so interested in education as one of the top priorities in in public policy. So we welcome that. We think that's that's immensely important. And if 
you know, if that's such a priority for you, you will make it happen and, and, and drop the politics behind uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of colleagues I want to re go back on because I'm to make sure that they uh, get the opportunity to ask their questions. Uh, Fergus, did you want to come back in um, and ask a further question? Um, I can't hear you, unfortunately. Oh, I'm very sorry. Can you hear me now, Stephen? Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, I, I was very pleased to hear the, the very positive remarks that, uh, uh, that Beatrice made with regard to the confidence that is displayed by Scottish young people. I thought that was a tremendously positive comment and very, very in, encouraging. Uh, and I, I'm afraid I, I would have to also echo Mr Dornan's remarks. I, I do think that the remarks that another member made were inappropriate. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to actually turn to James Dorn. I want to make sure he has had an adequate opportunity to make uh, his uh, ask his questions. James? No, no, no. I'm fine. I'm f You're fine. I'm fine. Thank okay. you. Very good. In which case, I'm going to return to a couple of members who have indicated that they would, uh, or three members, if we have time, that have indicated they would like to ask further questions. Starting with Ross Greer. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to ask um, some questions, or probably just for the purposes of time, one question uh, on the governance arrangements around curriculum for excellence, and specifically um, what your findings were in relation to the Scottish Qualifications Authority and Education Scotland as the two major agencies responsible for delivery and their relationship. So, in response to your report, the Scottish government's announced that. Those two bodies are essentially being merged. The, the inspection function of Education Scotland is being removed and, and becoming independent, which is uh, supported across uh, our Parliament. But the body responsible for developing the curriculum and the body responsible for developing qualifications will now be brought together. Can I ask if that's a common arrangement in other comparable education systems? Because uh, I recognise the um, points that were made that the qualification system and the curriculum simply do not align. So, on the face of it, it makes a lot of sense. If we bring the two agencies together, hopefully we will get better alignment. But is that a common governance arrangement? Um, so, we, you know, we did find that, as I said before, that uh, the this system is, as you said, is not aligned and you have um, SQA and then um, CFE that, that don't respond to each other. In some systems, this is separate. The, the SQA type of institution is a separate um, institution that does quality control, or it can be like an inspectorate sometimes or others. You also have a, a kind of unique system of, of qualifications that is very UK-based that many systems do not have. So systems have, you know, an external test that is developed by the government and, and that's it. Here you have a set of qualifications that are developed by an independent or semi-independent institution. And uh, and so it's it's a bit unique actually, this this approach. So we I, I'm not sure what example I can give you. The one that for us was the most um, valuable one was the Irish NCCA, which is a professional institution that uh, defines, reviews the curriculum and provides advice to the government on how to shape the curriculum, and then the government takes action on it. And uh, we just, you know, we. 40% of the homes that are on policy are either second or holiday homes. Ah, something's gone wrong. <laughs> or something's going right now. Back to you, Beatrice. Sorry. So there are there are you know we the NCCA is an example that that we really build on for our advice for you because it's an independent institution that shapes the curriculum that gathers opinions from different stakeholders and has professional staff working on on the different uh, curriculum areas. We find Northern Ireland, for example, has both remits within one institution and uh, others. 
at this point, I, I'm not sure, but I can send you more information as soon as we get off and I can um, send you this. We, we did not recommend that qualifications and curriculum be in the same institution, but we said that student assessment beyond qualifications be with curriculum in the agency. So that's up, I think for us, we left it a bit open for Scotland to decide how to handle this. So we didn't have a direct recommendation stating that, you know, about SQA. Thank you for that. Um, Ross, are you perfectly happy with that reply? Yes, thanks, Camino. That was very useful. I'm going to then turn to Willie Rennie. Oh, I beg your pardon. I think Roman had something she wanted to contribute to that comment. Um, maybe before we go to Willie, Roman, would you like to come in? Thank you, Convener. It, it was just to reinforce what Beatrice said, that uh, when we speak about student assessment, it doesn't only uh, apply to qualifications. And in the report, it is very clear that we are talking about student assessment being treated by the same agency as the agency treating the curriculum so that they are coherent, but that the, the question of qualifications is not is not part of that argument. It is left for um, for further um, reflection by, by the Scottish. Thank you very much for adding that. And now I will turn to Willie Rennie. Uh, thanks, Convener. I want to turn to the issue of knowledge. You've You've uh, made quite a lot of comment and conclusion recommendations in the report about how knowledge is addressed, that there's often a misunderstanding about what it covers, but also how it is addressed in the broad general education and that how that should change. Pupils have commented in your report that they find it difficult to catch up with the knowledge requirements of the senior phase because it's not been covered sufficiently in the broad general education. But the report also identifies a bias in the system to one of the four capacities, i.e. successful learners. So is there a tension there? Have I understood that correctly? And can you explain a little bit more about knowledge and what you think needs to be done in order to, to properly address it? Um, so we, we did find that um, there is a gap in the knowledge, in the concept of knowledge in CFE and that the focus of senior phase is fully on knowledge. And the focus on BG is more on the four capacities more broadly. And so students were telling us exactly what you said, that when they arrive to a senior phase, they're not fully prepared because they had the they were they have a broad um, they have been going through a, a broad type of pedagogy approach to learning and, and the, the, the renewed focus in senior phase of only knowledge is, is, is challenging for them. So um, this is, and this is what the qualification system is actually weighing in, in senior phase. So this is one of the issues that we detected that is quite important and that how, how knowledge is, kids are being tested fully in senior phase on knowledge, but not on the other types of skills and competencies. So there's a gap for students at age 14, 15, when they move on to, um, to this new regime of, of the two-term dash in a way. So, but there's also another issue which knowledge, you know, Scottish are very, you know, the issue of knowledge is at the heart of the proudness of your of Scotland, and we understand how knowledge needs to be built in in order for CFE to move forward well, well supported by everybody. And we think it's important to give it a bit more of a of a clarity in the vision to include knowledge a little bit more in the vision as you move forward, so that it is well supported by everybody. And we think it's important to to consolidate the concept in BGE as well, so that kids arrive well prepared. So there needs to be more of a, you know, a seamless process for students in terms of knowledge from three to 18, rather than, you know, the four capacities and then on, only knowledge. So to consolidate that throughout C CFE. But the, but it's, thank you for that. Um, but there's, oh, elsewhere in the report, it does talk about a too much of an emphasis on the successful learners 
aspect of the four capacities. So is there not a slight contradiction in all of that? If you're saying more on knowledge, but then in the other bit of the report you're saying there's almost too much on knowledge. There's too much on knowledge in senior phase, and uh, and uh, and so we think that this is the, the the balance that needs to be required that's not there yet, and so uh, it's important to make sure that in senior phase the four capacities are better developed and better assessed actually so that there is you know the, the concept of knowledge is spread throughout uh, the learning of students from 3 to 18 so i think that's still something for for you in scotland to consider how best to make sure that knowledge is built in across the four without forgetting the three other types of capacities that you prioritize and that we consider very important as well just, just one other short one then. Does that not then cause a problem with the connection with universities, further education, higher education, and employers that they are used to the current system of a focus on um, knowledge, um, and now you're proposing change that? How do we make sure that's fully integrated and that we don't have a, a problem at that end by solving the problem be between BG and the senior phase? Well, the, I think the we consider and have provided commentary on the assessment system needing to change that also you know it does not exclude knowledge but it gives some weight to the other types of skills and competencies this is happening internationally and uh, many universities and and uh, employers are recognizing students also because of other types of skills that they consider as important as knowledge and uh, so we think that Changing the assessment system will actually have uh, an impact on how students are prepared throughout the whole system. Thanks. Thank you, Willie. And a comment from Roman on the same subject. Thank you, convener. Uh, just a quick point about um, Mr. Rennie's point about a question whether the the bias on successful. Uh, towards successful learner and the, the lack of treatment of knowledge is a contradiction. It, it is not if you have a look at or, or look a bit deeper about what knowledge can cover and how there are different kinds of knowledge and different um, ways of using this knowledge. So what, what the report is getting at uh, and what our argument is, is that it's not so much that um, there is there is not enough or too much knowledge. It's just that the the focus is not is too much on one specific type of knowledge and one and one specific way of rendering and using that knowledge um, within student assessment, for instance. And that way is uh, as students grow older and get to senior phase and are preparing for qualifications, the they uh, they tend to narrow the the kind of knowledge that they are focusing on because what is asked of them in most qualifications, again, a generalization here, but in most qualification is rather to render the concepts and memorize um, content rather than show in a specific task or a specific um, exam ways that they can use this knowledge in order to get to another, uh, to another um, conclusion or to, to build their argument. So, I, and I'm, I'm emphasizing here that I'm not speaking about skills or competencies. I'm, I'm talking about how the way of learning and the way of, of rendering the knowledge also is encapsulated in, in what we call knowledge and what we say CFE should get into, because knowledge is not only content and memorization. It's getting the facts right so that the arguments, the thinking process, and later on, the development of skills, for instance, can can have that basis. So, so that's the distinction that's important, I think, to 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 bring um, to explain that it's not a contradiction. It depends on how deep you go in, into the concept of knowledge. I hope this Thank will you help. Thank you for that. Very helpful. Thank you very much. And we have got one final question before I return to the Deputy Convener for a comment, um, and that's from Michael Maher. It's in the same line as the discussion we've been having. Michael? Yeah, I, I think 
this is, these have been really useful um, points. Uh, Kavina. I mean, one of the um, the most common comments that I hear from university principals and vice principals is a real concern about the level of knowledge and capabilities, capacity within some of the people who are coming to them as undergraduates, particularly in STEM subjects, in terms of first years, uh, having to reteach or teach things that would previously, in their understanding, have been in the school curriculum. Um, now, and I think Willie Rennie's comments in terms of that, in terms of how do we work with universities uh, to try and understand that, or is, is there an inevitability in that? I think is perhaps something that the, the committee could discuss at a later point. But I actually, my, my question relates to maybe in my mind some of the causal um, factors around this. So there's much research, including a report from this committee in the last session of Parliament, um, that noting a key issue as senior phase implementation was the timetabling issue in the fourth year. To get quite technical about this. Um, and that issue was predominantly created by moving from standard grades being 160 hours of teaching time over two years, the nationals being 160 hours taken over one year. Um, so, in your research, how key do you think those issues are to the implementation of the curriculum? Um, and, and any comments you had on the, the what it seems to me to be the inevitable narrowing choice as a result of that in terms of the, the senior phase and actually the general education. Uh, that the general education experience uh, would, would be useful as well. So, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, we we hear you. I think this is a very very uh, valuable comment and the, the issue of depth versus breadth, especially in senior. Base is quite important and was raised in a number of, uh, of schools by students and by principals, especially. And we heard students having to take like 17 courses or too many. So in the end, they arrive into university without having depth into any subject, but being, you know, having covered many, many subjects, but not really lacking the, the minimum level of knowledge and capacity in specific areas. So this is why we did recommend potentially you know, to find, uh, uh, you know, we, d we don't want to constrict the choices that students should make. And that was, you know, we were very um, impressed by everybody wanting to provide choice, 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 as much choice as possible for students and as much options for students in schools as possible. But uh, to really find a balance between that choice and the quality of education provided and to possibly, you know, to define a number of typical pathways or, or profiles for students who would then go into university in specific areas and they would have, you know, possibly a, a limited number of compulsory courses that would give them enough breadth while also providing some um, choice and diversity of, of, uh, of courses as well. So, you know, how to marry that is an issue, but we think it's important to tackle. So it's a very, very good question. Thank you. A brief comeback from Michael and then uh, to co -carb straight away. Just in, in, th 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 thanks, Kabira. And maybe just the, on, on that issue of I have really struggled in terms of my home city of Dundee to try and understand some of this process where there has been a collapse in terms of choice for many students. And it's not clear to me whether it's been driven by this process that we're describing alone, or whether the fact that the council administration have cut one in eight teachers, 12% of all teachers out of the schools, that is resulting in that kind of narrowing. Could you make any comment in terms of the work that you did in terms of the resourcing of choice versus the structure of choice? Where do you think is that? What are the constraining factors? Uh, we did hear, you know, many principals saying they didn't have the teachers available to provide enough choice, and uh, and so that's an issue that was important in providing the right number of courses. And and the other one is, you know, students choose strategically their courses because they want to get into university, and so that are they themselves and their parents also asking for an hour or a choice because that's what's being measured to enter into further education or higher education. So there is a balance to be made um, in that. And I think you're right in what, what is the question? Is it that schools don't have enough 
teachers to teach all the choice that is necessary or the capacity or, or the school capacity, the classroom capacity. And when they open up choice, they may have only three students instead of having, you know, so it's quite an, an, a resource issue to offer so much choice when it may not be taken up by so many. We heard of some very interesting partnerships in a, I don't know if it was in a school in Sky that we visited where they were, you know, collaborating with other schools to be able to provide, um, you know, when they couldn't provide some choice, they were offering it. It was between Orban and Tyree schools, and they were partnering themselves so that they could offer the right amount of choice uh, when they, one of the specific schools could not do that. So analyzing, you know, the, the, the number of teachers the number of students who would enroll in courses was an issue that that principals told us led them to make strategic choices in terms of the courses that they would offer. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you to Michael Mara. I'm turning to Kokab Stewart now for a comment. And I'm going to ask one final question, if you will indulge me. But Kokab. Um, thanks, Stephen. I'll try and keep it brief. I'm keeping an eye on the time there um, as well. Um, it was just regarding the knowledge. Um, I'd like to thank um, the doctor for clarifying the gap in the concept of knowledge um, and uh, for the contribution to clarify what that meant. Um, I would say in primary school, um, there is an emphasis on the application of knowledge. So you acquire knowledge, but what do you do with it? And you're using problem solving and critical thinking skills because, I mean, the curriculum for excellence, from what I remember, was based on Bloom's taxonomy. So knowledge is actually right at the bottom in that sort of triangle of, you know, uh, higher order thinking skills. Um, so when we're looking at assessments, where at the moment I think that I would agree that it doesn't match uh, the knowledge, but also like how children learn as well as what children learn. Because you know our young people are actually learning very differently. A lot of it is application of that knowledge using their critical thinking skills and their problem solving. And at the moment, I don't think that our assessments actually measure it that way. We're still into pencil and paper or digital online as a replacement to that. Um, so I, I welcome your clarification because I don't think everyone always understands that. Uh, really, uh, that you know everyone. You must learn facts. You must learn this. But actually, what do you do with that? How is that going to benefit uh, society or you know, help you with your jobs? That also feeds into skills, because I mentioned that before, is that we are going to need people that can apply skills, not just knowledge. And it broadens it out not only to university entry, but also to colleges and to apprenticeships as well. So thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Kokab. And, and to go with that comment, um, let me ask one final question. You packaged together quite a lot of recommendations in your report. My simple question, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to press you for a very short answer, is what recommendations should be prioritised? So which of your recommendations do you feel we should be looking at first? Beatrice. <laughs> Difficult question um, to the end. <laughs> it's a difficult question. So we have our core message for us is to find a balance between breadth and depth of learning throughout CFE and adapt the pedagogical and assessment practices in the senior phase. That's a very important one. I think the balance between assessment and CFE needs to be found and that should be a priority, but not immediate because it will take a while to think about what is the best way. Um, to combine a systematic and inclusive approach to curriculum review with a clear division of responsibilities. We found that it was very, very complex. Many people, many committees, many different institutions, and it needs to be um, more clearly divided. And then to support the teaching profession and aligning the qualifications to the curriculum. So for us, what's important is that students should have a whole trajectory and not a gap also between um, BG. And just to respond to Ms. Stewart, what we heard from students is that, you know, while hires are 
teaching to the test or test, you know, knowledge repeating and test, the advanced hires were actually quite welcomed by students and they did feel that it was measuring more of these, uh, how they use knowledge to, to you know, to, to respond in a test and they were valuing that as more similar to a, the CFE experience. So I'll stop here. I don't know if Roman has anything to do or anything to say or we, or we are actually limited in time. No, let's hear from Roman. We've got time for that. No, I think Beatrice made the point very clear, and I wouldn't want to add on to this because this is really our, our core recommendations. Super. Well, it remains for me to give you a very, very sincere thanks for uh, the time that you've both given us uh, this morning. You've given us two hours. We've, we've uh, put you under a lot of questioning and uh, you've not wilted once, so thank you for that <laughs> and for the tremendous benefit that I think you've given us um, as you have responded so fully to the question. So we're indebted to you, we appreciate that, so thank you to Beatrice, Dr. Beatrice Pond from, and uh, Roman Vianney from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, your, your time this morning has been an investment in our understanding of uh, what you have, uh, the work that you have done for us. So thank you very much indeed. Um, the public part of today's meeting is now at an end, and uh, I will now suspend the meeting. Can I ask members to reconvene immediately, if they would, on Microsoft Teams, and that will allow us to consider our final two items in private. Thank you very much. <laughs>